thank you so much, Michelle. Um, and I, I hope it's okay with everyone that I take my mask off. It's like, okay, thank you. I, <clears throat> it's a little hard to, to talk and, and see with my glasses getting fogged up. Um, so um, it, this is, this is kind of an emotional event. Um, it's, uh, it's really amazing to see all of this work together and these different phases of Mark's life. Um, I, um, I'm not doing a sort of standard academic talk where I read from a, pre from prepared, uh, a prepared text. Um, I have put together kind of a narrative with my images, um, almost all of which are drawn from Mark's slides. Um, and um, hopefully it will tell a certain kind of story that's like one thread through his life. Um, and I changed the title a little bit. So I had originally said, Mark Rogovin and the Black Left, Building an Art of Allyship. And I realized that what I, what I have to speak to really has a lot to do with the mural movement. And, and, and that is also about solidarity with, um, with black artists and um, black leftists. Um, so that it's it's all kind of bound up together, but I think some of his work that I'll allude to more briefly that really had had, had a, lot, a lot to do with um, supporting um, black political figures um, who were on the left, whether it was the Black Panthers or someone like Paul Robeson. Um, he, you know, he he just was always working um, to be a good white ally to um, the black struggle. And, um, and so that we'll see, you know, we'll see that along the way. And I have some specific images that deal with that and a, and a particular artifact that I'll pass around. Um, so this is, this is an image of, of Mark when he was one of four artists working in the basement of the Museum of Contemporary Art in its first location, um, uh, painting murals while visitors came in and watched them paint. Um, and then each of the murals was placed around the city in, in various locations, some of them moving, some of them not. Um, and you will see more of this. This is the murals for the people exhibition. Um, I, have, I have a lot more images to show of this, including a, a, a video that I'll show at the end. Um, but this was my first introduction to Mark Rogovin. Um, seeing <clears throat> this photo of the Wall of Respect. So this mural um, painted in 1967, painted and I should say created because it was, there were photographers who worked on it as well, who, who, uh, um, who put their, po their photographs up on the wall. Uh, so this is the Wall of Respect created by this group called Obasi, the um, Organization of Black American Culture. Um, in 1967 at 43rd and Langley um, and Mark's mural archive, uh, mural photo archive includes um, some of the best documentation of the sort of middle and later stages of the Wall of Respect. So there are other images that are maybe more commonly seen representing the earliest stage. So this is Bobby Sengstack's photo on the left. Um, but Mark arrived in Chicago, um, I believe in 1968, um, after having been in Mexico working with Siqueiros and immediately started documenting the mural movement in Chicago, including the Wall of Respect. So I um, n had known this image, um, and I remember, I think, I, I, I knew I wanted to get his permission to use it for something. I can't remember what it was for, what, if I was writing an article, or there's some reason why I wanted Mark's permission to use his image. And I saw that he was giving a talk I think it might have been organized by Marguerite Horberg, I'm not sure, but wh whoever it was who was the organizer, I emailed them and said, do you have contact information for Mark Rogovin? And they said, yeah, I'll get it to you. And then I waited <laughs> and waited and waited and they didn't get it to me. And then the um, 50th anniversary um, of the Wall of Respect was coming up and people were coming together to start working on like how can we commemorate the 50th anniversary of this um, really important groundbreaking mural, which was really the first outdoor public mural of the 1960s and 70s mural movement. So it really generated a huge amount of energy and interest and you know, galvanized a mural movement in the United States in that period. Um, so it was, you know, it was, this was an important event to, to commemorate. Um, and I think I went to a meeting at the Gustavo Museum and Mark showed up. 
And so I you know, immediately went up to him and said, I've been wanting to you know, get your contact info so I could talk to you about your, um, your images of the Wall of Respect. And then you know, set up a time to meet and eventually went through some of, some of his slides with help scanning them, getting, helping them to get archived digitally, um, and um, asked if I could interview him as part of this Never the Same project that I was working on at the time. Uh, which is a now kind of dormant, but um, he was one of the first interviewees for it. Um, and, you know, I just, I immediately kind of, he opened up all this just amazing detail about his life and work um, that um, it, it's just, you know, it's amazing. So, so the interview is at neverthesame.org, and I'll, I'll give the URL for that um, a little bit later, but, um, it just there, there's just a lot of amazing detail that he um, provided about the, these various aspects of his life, and it was a, over the course of a number of interviews that um, that were that are all kind of like edited together in this one um, this one narrative. So this is um, this, this is these are two images that represent kind of what I'm talking about when I say the black left. Um, so on the one hand, on the left. Um, this booklet, and I will, I have a copy and I will pass it around, um, When One of Us Falls, which Mark helped to organize with Margaret Burroughs at the Southside Community Arts Center. So here's the actual copy, and I'll um, just be, be careful with it. Um, it's a precious object that I just finally got back uh, after it was on loan um, and then not returned during the course of the whole pandemic. Um, uh, so this is a booklet that contains writings and art by artists and writers um, to commemorate Fred Hampton after his murder by Chicago police and FBI um, in 1969. Um, and then on the right is uh, this book that, uh, that Mark uh, spearheaded as part of the Paul Robeson Centennial Organization in 1997-98. Um, so it just was a really important commitment for him to keep the memory of these figures alive, right? And to, and to um, kind of contribute to um, the history of, of um, struggle on the left and in particular black liberation struggles um, and artists and writers and activists who were part of those struggles. So I think that um, this, the, the, I had made some edits to the presentation after Chris downloaded the, um, the, the, the offline version. So there may be a few things that, um, that, that are not in here. But another figure I, I had been um, intending to show on that image was Angela Davis. And we'll see a lot more of Angela Davis um, in, in uh, subsequent slides. But this was just to allude to um, his experience in Mexico working with Siqueiros and just, you know, just to kind of note some sort of formal parallels between works, whether by Mark Rogovin um, compared to work, a work by De, uh, David Siqueiros, or um, even something like William Walker's History of the Packing House Worker and Diego Rivero's Mexico Today and Tomorrow. So this is something that Melanie is going to be talking about more, I think, and so I didn't want to spend too much time on it, but just to say um, that when Mark Rogovin came to Chicago, he was bringing with him um, this knowledge and this history of the Mexican mural movement, but it was also something that other artists in Chicago were aware of, but something that Mark was really, um, I think, an important figure for was visual documentation, collecting images, maintaining an archive of images. This was something that he had on the second floor of the public art workshop, a kind of library of mural images that were made available to anyone who wanted to come and look at them. So that the um, the sort of what was what was happening in other parts of the world and even other parts of the city or other parts of the of the United States um, could kind of be circulated among muralists as well as you know children and youth workshops um, learning about murals and and um, and making their own murals right. Um, this is an image one of his images also from the the Wall of Respect. Um, this is a this, again, kind of to illustrate the, the changes that happened over the course of the life of the Wall of Respect, um, there are various interventions that were made, and 
Mark documented those changes over the, the, the sort of later life of the mural. Um, and this is the wall of truth, which, or a portion of the wall of truth, which was painted opposite the wall of respect by William Walker, who was one of the original wall of respect artists, and Eugene Ida Wade, who was one of the, who, who was an artist who Walker brought in um, a few months into the project, and which like had various consequences in terms of the sort of original artists um, uh, kind of, uh, there, there, there is controversy over the fact that Walker brought Ida into the project. Um, let me just put it that way. I'll be sort of diplomatic about it. Um, but after the wall, after the um, kind of denouement of the Wall of Respect, Walker and Ida together worked on the Wall of Truth along with other members of the community, especially young people in the community, and kind of providing a, a model for um, not just accepting community feedback and kind of listening to what community members had to say about how to make, how, you know, uh, uh, whether they you know, appreciated the mural, didn't appreciate the mural, what kinds of topics they'd like to see represented, but actually inviting young people to work on the mural directly. Um, and that's something that Mark then you know, carried out as well with his work with the Public Art Workshop. Um, so this is an image of the Free Angela Davis, Free All Political Prisoners mural, which he worked on at the Museum of Contemporary Art. So this is the 1971 uh, Murals for the People exhibition that was at the MCA. And um, the, I'm gonna show some images of the various different murals that were created as part of that project. So there were artists, four artists, um, Mark Rogovin, Ida Wade, William Walker, and John Pittman Weber all working in the basement um, painting uh, with people coming through and watching them paint. So they were kind of on display as, as the art, um, not only as the artists. And um, I think that, okay, this is, the, that's good. Um, the, the, um, this admission pass that you see on the right was created for the Southside Community Art Center. So people who came into the Southside Community Art Center could get a free pass to go to the Museum of Contempor Contemporary Art. And that's something that the, the artists made a commitment to um, and insisted that that be something that the MCA would accept. The idea that people, people in the communities that, that were kind of generating the mural movement should have free access to the museum and wouldn't, shouldn't have to pay to get in to see these artists working. So um, these, I am inc including here some quotes from the interview that I did with Mark. So these are images of him working on the Free Angela Davis mural. Um, and he talks about um, Joe Shapiro, who was the president of the mu museum's board, um, having to agree to give, um, give enough money that they could purchase really, really high quality paint and take it with them at the end of the project. So they got enough paint that they could then go out and paint more murals after this, the exhibition was done. Um, so yeah, I negotiated the paint, the amount of money that Joe Shapiro was to put out, a freaking fortune. I mean, what, when that project was done, we walked out of there with 10 gallon buckets and this was great, great paint. It was quite something, it was really a great time for us. And then he, this mural, the Angela Davis mural, was taken out and moved around. It wasn't installed permanently in any particular place. It was moved around to different events, including one where Angela Davis's mother um, spoke. Um, and there were some conflicts. The group of, of artists um, had some kind of tensions among, among the group, um, but also um, wanted to make a point about the, the situation that, that they were in as really anti-institutional artists who were being brought into the institution and what kind of, um, what kind of change in, in the institution could they actually make. So they wrote up a statement that was the artist statement um, and, um, and you know, kind of delivered it to the museum. He says one of the sort of amusing things about the employment of this little group of artists was that we used to refer to um, the, the they, we used to say that they were, they used to say they were doing the project in the basement of the museum and they got all bent out of shape because they referred to it as the lower lobby but we always used to joke about that so. 
Um, but this was really one of the first projects that employed artists to be there on a full-time basis. I mean, it's very common now for like social practice artists to be kind of brought into museums to work um, within the museum um, in a kind of performative way. But this was like something um, that was new at the time. Um, it was really wonderful. It was wonderful us and wonderful for the public and the press. Plus, he says again, <laughs> we got to purchase whatever paint we wanted. And so we ordered the Polytech acrylic, which is the best acrylic in the world. Um, we, when we finished with the projects, it continued to supply the mural movement in Chicago for endless projects. Um, and so, yeah, you see some of the paint there. Um, and I will, I, I have a short film um, that, that I'll show at the very end of this talk that um, gives some shots of the artists in action. Um, here's William Walker um, painting the Wall of Love, which was later installed on the facade of the Southside Community Art Center. I'll show some images of that as well. Um, so here's, here he is again painting, and then there's a shot of a portion of the mural. And there, here it is on the facade of the Southside Community Art Center in like the upper tier of the center's facade. Um, with a little kind of um, opening ceremony gathering on the right hand side. And the man you see at the upper left is Herb Nipson, who was the, um, the chairman of the board of the center at the time. So this is probably around 1972. And one thing that's interesting is doing, um, putting together the images for this presentation, I realized something I had never realized before how very long this stayed up on the facade of the Southside Community Arts Center. Um, it's, so here it is in 1983 um, during the San, uh, which I was able to date because of the San Gilliam exhibition. I had records of, of its being in 1983. So you can see that it's very much deteriorated, right? It's, it's lived through 10 Chicago winters on the facade of the building. Um, but it's, um, it was still there at, at that point. I'm not sure when exactly it was taken down. But I think one of, so you know, there's this very direct connection with the tickets that were available at the center to be picked up and then used at the MCA. And it was important for William Walker to make this commitment to, to kind of return the work to the Southside Community Arts Center as well to keep this kind of circuit with the community going. And, and then I skipped over, um, because I had this, the sequence a little bit out of order, but this is um, the mural that John Pittman Weber did, Fuerte Somos Ya, it, it, which is, I, I think parts of it are still at the Segundo Luis Belvis Cultural Center. And then um, um, Ida's panels um, were, were to be installed above the Wall of Meditation or as part of the Wall of Meditation at the Olivet Community Center. Um, and I think because of electrical lines, they were not able to actually be installed. So in fact, I'm not sure what, what happened to them, um, but it was another set of mural panels that were painted at the museum. So um, the next thing I'm gonna talk about is the public art workshop. And there's um, ample material about the public art workshop here over, over in this corner in particular. And then this is also related to the public art workshop. Um, but this was an art center that Mark created on the west side in Austin. Um, and he, in the interview that I did with him, he tells a little bit of the story of, of um, finding the space and starting to use it, 5623 West Madison Street. And the images of it are just so alive with so much energy and so much activity. Um, it's, it's just amazing The every, you know, it's a storefront space. There are always pictures up in the windows, all different kinds of messages and, um, and kids coming in and out. So there are lots of um, great images. And some of these are on the website that Michelle has put together. Um, I love these kids. Um, So it was, you know, a, a, I think he was making a real commitment to kind of be in a neighborhood and think about what was going on in that neighborhood and who were the kids, you know, the youth um, who lived there and um, trying to find activities that connected with them and to really work on creating community around art. 
and creating art around community. Um, this is one of the murals that was created with the Public Art Workshop, an International Year of the Child mural on the west side. I don't have an address for it, but, um, but it was, I think, um, not, not too far from where the Public Art Workshop was. And here are some images. These are from, from the markrogobin.com website, um, just showing the making of that particular mural. One of the other things that, um, that he did in conjunction with the public art workshop was political street theater and making all kinds of props for street performances in, uh, in protests and other kinds of activist actions. So, this is one that's uh, uh, against pesticide poisoning through crop dusting. So there's like, you see the, the, um, the plane on top of the VW bus and then the coffins. Um, and this is like a lesser known one of his uh, street theater projects. Um, this is one that, um, that uh, yeah, it's like my kid is escaping. <laughs> This is one that is very closely connected to the Angela Davis mural, right? Free Angela Davis. Um, and it was at the Bud Billiken parade. Um, and he you know, told, it, told this great story about it. So he tells who designed it. And then Lester had this really nice car. And like 30 feet into the parade, the fucking thing overheats. And Sylvia Woods burst into tears. She says, you worked so long and hard on this thing. You've got to be in the parade. And so a bunch of kids started pushing it, and they, they started pulling it, a bunch of kids started pushing it, and they made it through the parade. Uh, and this is a little bit cut off, but all the, uh, it went all the way through the parade, and when we got to intersections, there was a roar that went up, is what, is what he said. What year? Um, I think this was 72, but I'm not 100% sure. I, that's, that's what I think it is offhand, but I can find out. Um, all right, and this is 72. This is, um, this is a, uh, a, a battle between uh, the, the people say sign the peace treaty and the mad bomber who is Richard Nixon, right? Um, so, uh, and he talks about how the Peace Museum came about through this project because they took the props home, back to the workshop, um, it was in the, it, it retired, we retired it to the garage, and then one day we had a big cleanup, and Johnny, who was one of the kids who was always at the workshop, said to me, let's throw that thing out, you know, it's just taking up space. And I said just casually, you know, Johnny, it's a beautiful work of art, it really belongs in a peace museum. And from there, the idea of the peace museum came about, right, seven years later, so not immediately, but um, I think maybe more than seven years later, actually. So one of the things, and I alluded to this before, one of the things that the public work, art workshop did was to create an archive of mural images, both slides and books, um, images and books. This is one of the boxes um, that Mark's uh, mural slides were in, or still are in, actually now they're at the Southside Community Arts Center. Um, so an international mural resource center. So really, I think one of the, um, lesser known but really, really important contributions that he made was to creating and maintaining an archive of images that are in many cases the only documentation of certain murals that exist and that really document the global mural movement um, from, this, from the time period of the 60s and 70s in particular um, and also some earlier and some later. Um, so I'm just going to kind of quickly go through some of the images that are in the archive, um, just showing him being especially attentive to, um, you know, South and West Side muralists in particular, but also murals all over the city. And this is just Chicago. I'm not. I'm, there are many. You know, it's an international archive, so there are many murals from all over the world. Um, so John Pittman Weber, who was one of the muralists in the um, in the uh, MCA show. Um, Mario Castillo's Metaphysica, I think, was right near here. Um, it was definitely in this neighborhood. 
Um, I, had, I had entered some of the addresses of the murals in the, in the um, Google Slides presentation, that, uh, but I unfortunately did that a little bit late, so it didn't get picked up in the download. Um, so some of the um, documentation, so, so Vanita Green's Black Women, so these are, these, were, these are artists who were extremely young at the time that these murals were created. So Vanita Green was 17, Turtel only was 19, um, and he went on to be uh, an artist and educator, and he's quite well known now. Um, Benita Green, um, not too much more is known of her work as an artist. There's, there's some evidence that she went to Columbia College and may have done, you know, continued working as an artist, um, but the, she's, you know, her, her, um, her life is, you know, was, has not been well documented. Um, and I think she passed away um, a number of decades ago. Um, but she created a mural called Black Women that was a, a group of portraits of, black, of important black women, which was almost immediately defaced. And so she renamed it Racism after having initially named it Black Women. Um, Turtle Only's um, mural, No More Drugs, you would think this would have been a message that the Chicago police would have approved of, but they, they pulled him in for questioning because of his, his work on the mural. Um, and he decided he wasn't interested in having any more encounters with the police, and so that, that, that basically was the moment he stopped. Um, he decided to stop painting in public, and he ended up continuing as an artist, but not as a muralist. Um, this is Albert Zeno's Alewives and Mercury Fish, which is in the 55th Street Viaduct. It's now in, in, uh, in very bad shape, very deteriorated, um, but it's an early environmental mural, right, about, um, about mercury and fish. Um, and he was a, um, a, a, a black muralist who was not art school trained, who, who was, you know, painting alongside some of the um, some of the Hyde Park muralists, um, like Carol Yasko um, and, and, and William Walker, who was also painting in Hyde Park. Um, but I think his work and some of the work of some of the art, other artists and muralists really, um, it's important that Mark documented their work because no one else was out there documenting their work. Thing, things like the Psychedelic Shack, which was on the left, on the side of the building that was uh, headquarters for one of the Vice Lords groups. Um, and then even just things like painting on the rocks by the point or, or, or by, um, by, the, by the lake um, that are, you know, things that other, other people wouldn't have necessarily thought to photograph, right? Um, but he was interested in imagery that reflected people, um, you know, you, Using, using their mark-making skills, and um, and and expressing themselves. Right. It didn't matter whether they were art school trained or not. This is something that I found in the among the um, images from his archive, and I don't I don't know who created this. <coughs> I'm, I'm still trying to figure that out. It's a, it's a photo installation, a kind of photo mural somewhere near Cabrini Green. It's, it, the, the text refers to Cabrini Green. Um, and there is a name uh, associated with the text, but I don't know if it's the same person um, who, who took the photographs. So this, there's some, still some puzzles within the, um, within the archive that could you know, serve as the basis for some interesting research. Other, other murals, um, Fifth City Community Organization Sunburst on the left, and Don McElvain's Into the Mainstream, um, which was in North Lawndale on the right. Um, okay, and um, the last thing I'm gonna talk about is silhouette murals. And I wanna talk about this as something that, um, this practice, and you can see behind you there, um, one of the silhouette murals, a kind of, um, uh, a kind of maquette for one of, the, one of the major silhouette murals that he did with the public art workshop. And this was the sort of launch of the Peace Museum as well. It's a, it was a, a peace mural at Columbia College. Um, 
the the fact that he was working that he was um, photographing murals and working so much with slides, I think is um, just interesting to think about in relation to the practice that he developed of creating these silhouette murals which use slides as part of the medium of the creation of the mural. And for one thing, it's a very democratic kind of, within a democratic medium, we can think of murals as being a particularly democratic medium, but within, within that medium itself, it's an especially democratic form because it's something that doesn't require a lot of um, a lot of like draftsmanship skills. Like anyone can create a silhouette using projection, using shadows, and then trace it and paint within the, the outline, right? Um, so it was something that didn't that people who felt like they didn't have the necessary artistic skills to do other kinds of art practices could still do a silhouette mural. And so there are wonderful images within the collection of the creation of the, the silhouettes, right? Um, there, are just, there are many, many, many of these. And um, I just, this is something that I've, I've um, and I had actually talked with him about doing an article at some point, and I'm still hoping to do it or hoping to convince a graduate student to do it. Um, that, because uh, I just, I think it's such an interesting use of these different media, so so a medium slide projection that you know was very much of its time in a certain very much a you know a, a new medium 35 millimeter slide projection a, a new medium of its time combined with an old medium of painting on walls right and um, and and the the fact that you could create all different kinds of effects by um, tilting the projector or or um, positioning bodies in kind of oblique angles with respect to the light source um, to create these shadows which could then to create shadows which could then be re-photographed right and and um, reproject or, or photographed and reprojected onto a wall to create the outline which then the mural um, would use as the basis of the the figures um, so that is yeah so those images kind of help to see, um, those, those shadow images can kind of help to see how a mural like the Peace Mural would have been put together. Okay, and then a bunch of resources. So uh, markrogovin.com is this wonderful website that Michelle has put together, which has amazing archival photos um, of, you know, images from the mural archive, but also clippings and um, other kinds of photographs and articles um, never this, the never the same um, interview that I did with Mark, the public art workshop mural archive at the University of Chicago's uh, Visual Resources Center, um, which has a number of the um, mural images, in particular the Chicago murals from the um, from the workshops mural archive, and then a website um, that I worked on with. Um, the MAD studio, which is media, media and design studio at Northwestern, and with a, a lot of students helping out, Chicago Mural Movement Project website, which also has a lot of murals, also using some of the images um, from, from the public art workshop archive. 